Welcome to our science lesson for today. We're going to be carrying on looking at evolution and today we're going to be moving on from last lesson where we looked at adaptation, i.e. how an animal changes to match its environment, how it changes to survive in its environment. And today we're going to see how over many, many generations, over hundreds and thousands of years, that can lead to a change in an entire species. So, last lesson, as I just said, we looked at a variety of living things and we looked at features that they have that allow them to do well in their environment. So, for example, if you think of a giraffe, OK, so a giraffe has a really long neck and the really long neck allows it to get food out of very tall trees. Without that feature, it would struggle to survive. OK. Same way if we think of the water lilies that we talked about. They have really long roots. The really long roots allow them to take nutrients and they also have leaves that allow them to float. We're going to move on today to look at how adaptation is a key feature of what we would know as evolution. OK, so adaptation leads to evolution. Adaptation and evolution are two processes that occur over time. They don't happen straight away. They don't happen between a father and a son, for example, or a mother and a daughter or any of those combinations. OK, it happens over many, many generations. So let's have a look here. So these two moths are different because moth B was born with an unusual characteristic. OK, if you look at the colour, you can see straight away they are different. Moth B has a darker colour and that's advantageous. That means it's good because it allows them to blend into their surroundings and hide from predators. So moth A, oh dear, gets eaten because it can't hide. So moth A dies. Goodbye moth A. Moth B, however, lives because it has an advantageous trait, i.e. its darker colour, and therefore it is able to live and then it's able to have children and it carries on its bloodline. It carries on through the generations. Because of the lighter colour, moth A, easily seen by birds, goodbye. And moth B survives long enough to find a mate and reproduce, i.e. have children. Now, focusing on moth B, because moth A is dead, some of moth B's offspring may have the same variation. So this is moth B. Moth B has the children here. OK. Some of them also have the darker colour, which we know is good because it allows them to hide. They might live long enough to then have children of their own. So if you notice here, this is Moth B. Moth B has two children, offspring, with the darker colour. OK. They survive. Then this one here has four with the darker variation. And next time it will have more and so on and so on. So eventually what happens is that trait over thousands of years, the good traits, i.e. the ones we want, stay because they allow us to survive and they allow us to do well. And the bad ones, the ones that don't help, slowly die out. Which means over thousands and thousands and thousands of years, all of the species tend to have that advantageous trait. OK, so. Things that are useless tend to go. Eventually, they just sort of die out. And that's what we call evolution. We evolve, we become better over time. OK, so evolution, the theory of evolution, was thought up by a man named Charles Darwin. OK, and what he said is that a species is a group of animals or plants that are very similar. Members of a species share common characteristics. All humans have two eyes, for example. That's a characteristic. All humans have two ears. Again, it's a characteristic. Humans, lions, sunflowers and cats are all names of different species. OK. Now, he was a naturalist who lived in the 1800s. 
and he is famous for travelling the world and studying what makes animals and plants different, and he introduced the theory of evolution. So, evolution. Life is pretty tough for plants and animals, and some will die before they have the chance to give birth to their offspring. Therefore, offspring who inherit the best characteristics for survival are more likely to have children themselves, and so they pass those characteristics on. The ones that are more able to survive live to have children, and they pass those traits on. So a peahen picks the peacock with the brightest and biggest tail feathers to have children with. Peacocks have evolved accordingly, and it's rare to see one without big and bright tail feathers, because only the ones with big and bright tail feathers were able to then have children. The ones that didn't have the big and bright tail feathers didn't, and so they, their traits are no longer around. And now we look at the Galapagos finches. Now the Galapagos finch parents reproduce and create offspring. Now they're all slightly different and unique. Each and every one is slightly different. If you look here, you can see some of the variations, like a game of spot the difference. When bad weather affected the plant growth and there were fewer seeds to eat, the offspring had to eat larger seeds that would not normally be part of their diet to survive. They had no choice. It was either eat the larger seeds or die. But only the offspring with large beaks were able to eat those larger seeds. So they survived. The others, unfortunately, didn't. So that trait of having a large beak, what do you think happened to it? Do you think it carried on? Do you think more finches had the larger beaks? Do you think it didn't carry on? Well, the answer is, of course, it carried on because it was good to have that larger beak. It meant you could eat the food and therefore survive. They were able to have children and those offspring, they inherited the large beaks. So they were able to have children and so on and so on and so on and so forth until eventually all of them had those large beaks. And this is an example how over time animals can adapt to their environment and are able to survive better. The process where the ones that have the good stuff survive and the ones that have the bad stuff die is called natural selection, i.e. nature says you will survive because you have this advantage and unfortunately you with the small beak, you don't. Now, the vampire finch, yes, it's called a vampire finch, is one of the many, 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 many strange creatures on the Galapagos Islands. The unusual bird is a subspecies, so that means it's part of a species, of the sharp beaked ground finch. The bird earns its common name from its unusual diet. It occasionally drinks the blood of Nazca. The sharp-beaked ground finch normally feeds on seeds and insects, but such things can often be in short supply. The vampire finch evolved and then was able to eat the blood of other creatures to survive, hence why it got the name of vampire finch. Natural selection. Okay, basically, as I just said, those with the good features survive, those with the bad features die. That's kind of the long and the short of it, really. Spider monkeys. Yes, that is their actual name. Spider monkeys spend most of their lives living in a tree, canopies of the rainforests and in Central America. So South America, remember, where we're looking at for our Mayans and our geography topic. And they forage, that means they look for fruits and seeds. Can you see any ways that this species has adapted to suit its environment? Pause the video, have a look and see what you can see. Okay. 
So they have long, strong arms to allow them to grip onto the trees more easily. They have long toes and fingers, again, allows them to grip on. They also have a long, what's called a prehensile tail. You don't need to know what that means. Which they can use like an extra limb to help them climb. So their tail works like another arm or another leg, again, to help them climb and help them grip on. Those that didn't have those features wouldn't survive very long. Then we have the gorillas. Eastern lowland gorillas, gr gorillas, gorillas, he said, live in large social groups. They like to be with their friends, led by one male gorilla, this rather grumpy man here, or, or this grumpy man here, or this grumpy man here. Huh? They use hand gestures and facial expressions to communicate with each other. They have been seen making and using simple tools to help forage for food. So they've advanced so far that they can make equipment to help them. Look closely. Can you see some ways in which the species of primate is adapted? Well, gorillas have adapted and evolved to have very expressive faces. You can see emotions on their faces. You can kind of work out what they're feeling, which is very unusual for an animal. Normally they just have one expression and that's kind of what it sticks with. And they're very much like us with that. They can express themselves and communicate within their group using this. They can talk to each other, basically. Their hands are adapted to do complex things. Like us, they can use their hand for very complicated things. Whereas if you think of a dog or a cat, it just has a paw. And there's not really much it can do with that, apart from scratch me. Or is that just my cat? Probably it's just my cat. Their big, strong bodies help to protect themselves and others in their troop from other gorillas and occasionally from being attacked by leopards. So they have good defence and they have hands that allow them to do really complex stuff. And now we look at plants. Now plants have adapted and evolved to suit their environment too, millions of years. So this is a cactus and it's adapted to the hot and dry climate of the Sonora Desert in North America. Do you know any ways that they're adapted, cactuses? Well, they've adapted to store water inside them. So any water they get, they hold on to it because they know they may not get some for quite a long time. Their spines obviously are very spiky and that prevents animals from getting to the stored water so they defend themselves. And they have deep roots to so take in as much water as they can possibly find. This has happened over thousands of years. Way, 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 way back when, not all cactuses had these features, but the ones that did were the ones that survived. And now we look at us, humans. At some point in evolution, six million years ago, roughly, which is quite a long time, humans began walking on two legs. Before that, we didn't. It enabled us to hunt for food, to run away, and to use their hands to make tools. But in the start, only some of them could do it. But those were the ones that survived, and then eventually we can all do it. It's called bipedalism. By means two, pedalism, was an adaptation and it was a great one, which is why it was passed on. But you need to remember, adaptation is different to evolution. Adaptation leads to evolution over time. Now, your task after all of my waffling about evolution and natural selection and adaptation is we're going to focus on one animal in particular. We're going to focus on the anteater. It says here, the giant anteater is native to South America, again linked into our topic. It can be found in the grasslands and in rainforests. It mainly eats ants, surprisingly enough, and termites found in mounds and in rotting wood on the rainforest floor. It can dig out ants and termites with its long, sharp claws and can get into hard to reach places with its long nose. It has a specialised long tongue for licking up the ants and termites. Sounds disgusting, but there we go. Now, variation. I want you to imagine that an offspring is born with a new variation. It has a slightly longer tongue. What I want you to explain is what you think might happen to the anteater over thousands of years. Focusing on that one new variation, what's going to happen to that anteater? Is it going to pass it on 
then if it does pass it on, what's going to happen to anteaters over time? Think about what happened to all the other creatures. Now, the way you're going to do this task is entirely up to you. I have uploaded it to Seesaw, if you like. Now, on Seesaw, it's here. I've uploaded it with a couple of suggestions. So you could record a verbal explanation, i.e. you can click the little microphone button here and record yourself saying what you think would happen. And that's absolutely fine. That's great. We'd love to hear that. You could type a written explanation using the text button here. You could draw a picture showing what would happen over time, like we saw on some of those PowerPoint slides earlier with the moths, and you could take a photo of it. You could write an explanation and take a photo of that. Or you could record a video of you explaining it and upload that. However you do it is entirely up to you. You can make a poster if you like. But your job is to explain what you think would happen to the anteater over time if it had this variation. Okay? Lovely. Thank you very much for listening. Speak to you soon. Bye.